A warm welcome and thanks for joining us in the Learning Cafe for today's webinar. I'm Daniel Kim, your host. I'd like to begin with acknowledging the Aboriginal owners on the land on which we meet, the Gadigal people of the Eora Nation, and pay my respects to their elders past, present and emerging. This webinar is going to be recorded and will be shared after today's event, so if you wish to come back to it later or share it with others, you can. A word about language used in the mental health sector and its use in reference to the NDIS. In the mental health sector, the term consumer is uh, describing a person accessing a mental health service. In the context of NDIS-funded psychosocial services, we will use the term participant in reference to a mental health consumer with, a, with psychosocial disabilities and an NDIS plan. The term risk is used in our webinar today and it will refer to organisational risk and how it is managed rather than a participant. Now this is the third in a series of 10 webinars where we are systematically unpacking the new national NDIS practice standards and registration requirements to examine how they apply in psychosocial support services. I also acknowledge the lived experience of the people recovering from mental health conditions here today and in our community and their many contributions to the mental health service sector, particularly those with lived experience who contributed to the work of this project. Now we are also hearing from some very important speakers today. We are joined live in the studio by a couple of very important panellists, beginning with Cherie Avalos from the NDIS Quality and Safeguard Commission. Cherie has 20 years of experience in the disability sector and executive management and is currently the Acting Director of Provider Registration at the Commission. Cherie, welcome to the program. Thank you. Thank you for having me today. Oh, it's great to have you with us. I'm really excited to be here. Now, on top of that bio, you've also spent 10 years mm. as a provider in, the, in a past life. In a helping, past life. Yeah, yeah, as a provider, helping uh, and supporting people with mental health conditions to choose, find and get a job. Yes, I have. Yeah, um, I think the first person that I assisted was over 25 years ago. Oh, and, right. that, and that young man, I'll call him young, um, is still working, which is fantastic. That's wonderful news, mm. isn't it? Okay. It is. Looking forward to the insights you'll be bringing to us today. Thank you. And we're also joined by Fiona Lachlan, the General Manager from the Institute for Healthy Communities Australia, which is an approved quality auditor. Fiona has over 15 years of executive management experience across regional and corporate environments and this is everywhere in government, not-for-profit, private sector organisations and with tertiary business and legal qualifications. Fiona, welcome to the program. Thank you for having me. Pleasure to be here. It's great to have you with us. It's, it's, it's just good to have a panel where we've got somebody who's directing everything and somebody who's actually in the field helping people with the work that we're talking about. Yes. Mm. Yeah, thank you. Very good. Yes, with plenty <laughs> to cover today. Clearly lots to unpack and we're really looking forward to getting through everything. But before we dive into the content for today's webinar, I'd like to ask you to rate your current overall knowledge of the NDIS practice standards and registrations requirements. You'll be seeing a poll coming up on your screen at the moment. Please let us know how you would rate your knowledge, one being the least and five being five being expert. This is going to help us evaluate the effectiveness of the webinar and how future webinars can be planned and improved. And at the end of the webinar, we'll ask you this question again along with a survey question and that will help us clarify and better understand your learning needs. And just while you are answering those questions, uh, let's take a look at the Embracing Change series in, in, in a whole because it's a project of 10 webinars and one national forum. And it's part of a, le a learning strategy to assist organisations that provide services to people living with psychosocial disability and their supporters in achieving conformance of work practice with the new NDIS practice standards and registration requirements. It's all a bit of a mouthful, isn't it? It but, is, isn't it? But that's why we've got you here today. So um, in webinars one and two, we talked about the pain points and priorities for the providers, and you'll see it on your screen right now, in applying those practice standards and psychosocial services. In the second webinar, we unpacked part one of the core module, rights and responsibilities, and how they were two sides of the same coin. And today, we are hitting part two of the core module, governance and operational management. Now, there's a lot to cover in that topic alone, so we're going to do it over two webinars. And today, we're going to look at the first four outcomes. The quality indicators being governance and operational management, mm -hmm. risk management, quality management, and information management. Gee, that's uh, quite a bit to go through. <laughs> I believe we might have another slide that shows you those four. So if we can get that up for us, uh, the specific outcomes. Yes, here we are. So it's the risk management, quality management, sorry, governance and operational management, risk management, quality management and information management that are the quality indicators we'll be talking about today. Uh, just as uh, talking about this webinar in particular and the learning outcomes for our viewers, 
it's almost like a high school where we're talking about outcomes-based assessment. Yes, doesn't it? Yes. And, <laughs> and <dot> university, actually. <laughs> That's it. The dot points we're going to try and cover today. By watching this webinar with Fiona and with Cherie, you will be able to describe the participant outcomes and the quality indicators for governance, operations, risk, quality and information management under the NDIS practice standards. You'll be able to recognise specific psychosocial work practice documentation that can meet these outcomes and the quality indicators. Recognise the pitfalls to avoid in preparing for audit against these outcomes and indicators and recognise the benefits to participants and the organisation of a successful audit result against these outcomes and indicators. Now, that is a whole lot of verbiage from me, so I think we'll just hand straight over to you, Cherie. Can you just take us through the, the pages 7, 8 and 9 of the practice standards? I can, thank you very much. But I actually think you're doing a great job <laughs> and you probably could have continued on with it. Um, look, I just want to refer everyone back to, um, it's on our website and I'm sure everyone has access to this, but this is the NDIS practice standards, um, my Bible. Um, and it does outline what we're talking about today. Um, through my presentation today, on through this discussion, um, I'll drill down in two of the practice standards, um, but then I'll refer to the practice standards um, guidelines and, and quality indicators. So I just thought I'd give you a little bit of background first, if that's okay. Mm -hmm. um, so what are the practice standards? They're the requirements that set out the standard of service that you must deliver to be a registered NDIS provider. Really importantly, they're a benchmark for providers to assess performance and demonstrate high quality and safe supports for participants. Each practice standard is built from a high level, um, from a participant outcome to support the quality indicators. Um, during a provider's application for registration, the NDS Commission that will advise you as the provider uh, what practice standards apply uh, to your application and what type of audit. Um, for the providers, uh, the providers will need to deliver. If you're delivering a high risk and more complex support, um, you'll be assessed against the core standards. And as um, we've just been told, that we're gonna look at the four of those core standards today. And if you are being assessed against the core standards, you'll actually um, be audited from a certificate with a certification audit, which Fiona's gonna talk about a yes. bit later. Fantastic. So I've gotta get this buzzer right. And just while we do, we would also encourage everyone to participate in the, uh, the conversation today. There is a live chat going on on this live webinar. If you click the purple button at the top of your screen, it's a bit of an online community going on. And Great, any questions that you ask will come through to us on this trusty old iPad of ours. And we'll go. We can either take questions as we go or we can take questions at the end. It probably would make sense to take them at the end. So okay. we'll, we'll let people that have works. their conversation online mm -hmm. and we'll get the questions filtered through to us. Mm. But yeah, if there's anything that's pertinent, we won't sort of interrupt and see how we go. I'm happy to. And actually, sorry, I should say hi to the community out there first. Too. Oh, cool. Yes, any, any <laughs> shout-outs that you'd like to do? Hi, <laughs> everyone. <laughs> I hope the weather's good where you are. <laughs> and I'm really enjoying that rain, may I say. Um, so if we're looking at the principles guiding practice standards, I thought I'd run that, through that as well before we delve down into the practice standards. Um, supports to the NDIS participants are to be consistent um, with the NDIS Act, um, so when you're looking at developing your policies and procedures under the practice standards, um, also I would refer to the Act as well. But the, the practice standards are consistent with the Act um, and they underpin core principles. And the core principles um, are around the participants. So the participants are assessed when engaging in community life. The participants are involved in the decision making. The diversity of individual participants, participants is supported. Uh, relationships are important to participants and they're recognised and participants' choice control is enabled and respected. So there's really key guiding principles. Now, are there, uh, is there a big difference between the guiding principles and the participant outcomes and quality indicators? Between the guiding principles? No, they're actually embedded within the quality mm. outcomes. Gotcha. Indicators, sorry, indicators. So, and they underpin all that. Yeah. Okay. So what does a practice standard look like? Well, the standard defines the outcomes that the NDS provider will be audited against. So Fiona will talk a bit more about um, how that will happen. Um, and if, um, if they wish to apply to be registered with the Commission, um, there's a high level in outcome statement, which I'll go through in a moment. They're all participant focused. 
they targeted so that the provider's focus is practical um, and it, it's and it's the elements of it is to guide the collection um, of the evidence. So I just want to in, in, in like sort of in, sort of in, um, emphasise that the practice standards are a guide, not and not all elements of service delivery. So the quality indicators they're evidence based and there's they're against each practice standard. So each practice standards, that's what it's going to look like. So let's have a look at one. So I'm going to, I've lost the top of that in this slide, but that's look, okay. Look down the, the bottom. Ah, I'm looking, sorry people, I'm looking up one screen and it's down on the bottom. So that's, so apologies there, first time. And um, so the one I thought I'd, I've, I've, I've chosen two to really sort of um, drill down in today, um, but the other two are, are just as, as important. Um, but the first one is around quality management. So the outcome um, is that each participant benefits from a quality management system relevant and proportionate to the size and scale of the provider. Look, I like to point out that's really important here um, when it comes when it, for the provider from the provider's perspective. Um, we're not looking at that a provider that is is small and has you know um, a couple of um, participants or uh, they would not have a quality management system that is as sophisticated and as large as a large organisation. Would you mm. say that, Fiona? Totally agree. Excellent. So the the. The quality indicators actually reflect that throughout the um, practice standards. So, as I said, the outcome is to age participant benefits from a quality management system relevant to the size and which promotes continuous improvement in service delivery. So, under um, each outcome, there's quality indicators. So, for quality management, we're looking at the provider maintains a quality management system uh, that is relevant and portionate to the size. We're emphasising this. Um, but also the system, to, the, the system that you have in place defines how you're going to meet the requirements of the legislation for these standards. So we're looking at um, the NDIS, uh, NDIS rules and um, the NDIS practice standards, standard rules. And the system needs to be reviewed and updated as required. Um, and I just thought I'd take this, this moment to talk about, um, and, and this is sort of um, to the side, but when I was a provider, um, the method that I use when it came to reviewing um, policies and procedures is that we looked at um, the time frame in which we'd review them depended on the risk that was associated to that policy and procedure. So, for example, and it's not a written rule, um, but for example, our governance policies we reviewed every 12 months. Um, feedback, uh, we reviewed that yearly. Complaints was every six months. Medication management every six months, give or take that. But um, so reviewing your policies and procedures and keeping them live and active and getting feedback from participants. Um, that's just my provider uh, the experience yep. there. I just thought I'd bring that experience in. As a provider. Yeah. yeah. The provider's quality uh, management system is documented. Um, and as I said, I've just talked a bit about internal audits um, that are relevant um, to the size again. Um, and that the provider's management system supports continuous improvement. So using the outcomes that you get back from uh, participants when you're looking at feedback, um, any um, risk-related data um, and evidence that you've got that inform. So evidence um, externally that can inform best practice for policies and um, procedures. And as I just said, feedback from participants and workers, yep. really, really important yep. from yep. both those, those avenues. And there's a lot in there, so if we could just get the slide back up one more time so that uh, oh, okay. the viewers can see those dot points just reiterated. So we've talked about the quality management systems, mm -hmm. um, and particularly as it pertains to supporting continuous improvement. Yes. That, that's what it is for most providers, isn't it? Continuous improvement. Yes. Yep. Yep. Keep evolving. Yep. The other one I thought I'd just drill down on and, and focus. Oops, I've got to... Go. Are you going to do it for me or are we going to do it? <laughs> I've got it to the next one now. Oh, wonderful. Thank you very much. Teamwork. See, Teamwork. that's what it's about, isn't it? Teamwork. Okay, so the next one that I'm looking at is information management. Um, so the outcome is the management of each participant's information ensures that it's identifiable, accurately recorded, current and confidential. So each participant's information is easily accessible to the participant and appropriately used by workers. 
Okay, so what are the indicators? Um, really importantly, again, that each, persist, each participant's consent is obtained to collect and use and retain the information to disclose. Um, each participant is informed how the information is stored and used and when and how each participant can access or collect their information and withdraw or amend their prior consent. And if you step, or if we refer that back to and link that back to your um, quality management system, you'd have that documented in your quality management system. There'd be a policy and procedure around how you would record, how you would gain this information and how it's kept private and confidential. So that would be in your policy and procedure. Each, um, sorry, an, an information management system is maintained that is relevant and proportionate to the size. So then again, as I mentioned before, depends on the size of the organisation and the scale of the organisation and at that time, at that point in time. Uh, documents are stored and appropriately used, access, transferred storage, security, retrieval, retention. So as, as I said, that would be included in your policy and procedure about information management. So how do you do it? And it's really important too because we're living in a post-GDPR world where everyone's interested in information, how you manage it, where does GDP. it go. GDP. GDPR, where mm. Europe basically changed the rules oh, about yes, privacy. <laughs> and now yes. everybody's like, oh, yes, yes. privacy. Yes. Yeah. Yes, and with all the Facebooks and Googles of this world doing all sorts of things with our data. Mm -hmm. This is really, really put. It is really, and it's really important. Mm. It is. Um, so they're the two that I thought I'd drill down in. Um, but as I said, included, included in... Uh, this uh, this um, webinar. Um, we've also got um, governance and operational management. Um, so if anyone's got questions about that, happy to, to take that on. But similar, you've got your practice standards, which talks about your key outcome and then how, how you can achieve that. Yes, mm. that's right. Okay, so we'll move on to um, well, what's important. Uh, practice standards audit audits. All registered providers must be audited against the relevant NDIS practice standards. Um, so I spoke about that previously. So if um, you're delivering a high risk, more complex um, supports, you'll be um, audited against the core, which is what we're talking about today and at the last webinar and at the next few webinars. Um, audits are proportionate to size. I, again, I've mentioned that, but I'll mention that again because it's really important um, for the organisation um, and, and the risk and the complexity of the services that they deliver. Um, we're approving and training more audit bodies. Um, we have some more audit training coming up. We've currently, there's currently around, oh, over 400 auditors, and I'm sure Fiona's got more that she would like to be trained. Yes, I yes. Do. <laughs> <laughs> which is good. So we're growing that, we're growing that market, um, and all auditors um, need to be trained um, through the NDIS Quality and Safeguards Commission before they'll actually be going out and auditing. Um, but just want to say we're here to help and guide you through the process. Um, access the website. It's really, there's a number of documents that step out step by step. Um, and there's also uh, documents around the practice standards. But more than happy for you just to give us a call on our 1-800 number. Um, it's on the website. And as I said, access our website and one of our contact centre staff or registration staff can help you through that process. Yes, thank you very much. That's oh. okay. I hope I didn't whisk through that. <laughs> <laughs> no, not at all. Uh, we've got a couple of questions coming through here. Okay. Um, Jane is asking, Cherie's slides mention providers can make a choice about uh, becoming registered with yes. the Commission. If a provider of services to people with a psychosocial disability doesn't wish to apply for registrations, yeah. what are the consequences? Okay, great question. Um, Non-registered providers of NDIS supports may still work with NDIS participants without being registered. However, um, it should be noted that there are a number of expectations which is mandatory. So if you will be delivering uh, behaviour supports, providing specialist disability accommodation, or there's the likelihood that an interim or ongoing use of a restrictive practice um, is in place when assisting the participant, you do need to register. But in addition to that, it should be noted that registration is necessary if you're supporting a participant who is agency managed. So if a participant is self-managed or uh, plan managed, you don't need to be a registered provider, but if they're agency managed, you do. Yeah, okay. okay? Yes, 
hope that helps you, Jane. Thank you for yes, the question. Yes, I hope it does, Jane. Yes, and of course, just a quick reminder, it's the purple button at the top of your screen to join the chat and get those questions in. Another one's coming through from Andrew, and he's asking, are you able to provide an example of what is best practice in terms of the way <coughs> participants' information is stored mm -hmm. and how they can easily access and change it? Okay, so we, we don't necessarily describe best practice. Um, however, just I'd just like to confirm that participants' consent it, uh, is obtained to collect and hold and disclose this information, so that's really important. Um, it's really important that participants understand how the information is stored, used, and how they can access and correct or withdraw their information. Um, information is accurate, it needs to be accurate and up to date in a timely manner. Uh, there are access controls for appropriate use for relevant workers, and really importantly, that the storage is secure and confidential. And this will actually be outlined in your policy and procedure. Uh, there's a few more coming through, but I think we might save them to the end, otherwise we're never going to get to Fiona's presentation. <laughs> Excellent. That's can, can I just um, tack on the end of what you just said, yes, Cherie? Please. So that's the kind of thing that auditors are going to be looking for when they're assessing mm. on site. Mm. So they want to actually ensure that participants understand how their information is treated. That's, that's one right. of the questions they ask. So, and, and, right, yeah. and rightly so. Mm. Mm. Yes. Thank you. Sorry. Thank you. And, and, and feel, please feel free to build upon each other's points during the course of the webinar. Oh, we'll be here for hours if we do. <laughs> but no, that's okay. We, we will. It's all right with me, but I don't know if it's all right with the MHCC and, yes, the, audience. and the audience. We'll try and keep the audience. It's all about the audience. Everybody. Yes. <laughs> that's why you're here, aren't you, Daniel? Uh, ostensibly, yeah. <laughs> I'm the one telling you to keep going. That's right. Okay. Well, thank you for the insights from a commission perspective. If thank we you. now uh, throw the part button over to you, Fiona to talk us through some of the presentations you've got from an auditor perspective. Okay, so um, as we've already heard, the NDIS Commission requires all registered providers to undergo an audit and that audit can be either a verification or a certification assessment. Um, the idea behind that is to provide assurance that certain standards of safety and quality in the de delivery of services and supports are being met. One of the objectives of this requirement is to boost provider capacity to achieve improved outcomes for participants. That's really what the whole system is about. Um, and the other way that I look at it, it's applying mainstream business excellence to disability services. For providers who have been used to uh, accreditation or audit in, under other schemes, they may find that while in the past the focus was on a minimum level of compliance and meeting the funding contract, this doesn't actually cut it anymore in today's environment. So just as you're required to demonstrate that you're maintaining and improving your professional qualifications and expertise through CPD, um, NDIS has included the audit requirement to encourage continuous quality improvement in all providers delivering services to NDIS participants. The audit scheme reflects an overall maturation in quality assessment. Say five to ten years ago, an auditor would want to see your policy documents and uh, would probably go through a bit of a um, tick list. This scheme, however, is about making sure that your governance systems, which when we talk governance systems, we're talking policies and procedures, are consistently applied and resulting in approved outcomes for participants. The way that we test that is by talking to people and making sure that they understand uh, what they're entitled to, what their plan looks like, what they can expect for the service, that the workers understand what the policies and procedures are. So if we were to um, only review your ARPA registration or even review our National Standards for Mental Health Services audit report, uh, it doesn't necessarily demonstrate that you're meeting the registration requirements. However, these certainly assist you in demonstrating compliance with the NDIS practice standards. So the audit is really about encouraging continuous improvement in providers. So you can see there's a consistent theme building here. Yeah. It's gradual, it's ongoing, it's incremental improvement that will result in better outcomes for service users. Yes. 
if we can just get that slide up one more time for everybody as well. It's, these are the key points that you're making. It's, it's a gradual thing. It's an ongoing incremental improvement. And it's just constant improvement and it betters everybody, doesn't it? It does. Particularly it does. for the participants. And that's really the focus. It does. You know, you have uh, a better service, a better business, but better outcomes for service users. Yeah. And a safe service. Yes. Yes. So one of the questions we get asked a lot is, um, so certification or verification and what's involved in each standard. One of the easiest ways or less complex ways to explain it is for those businesses that are delivering lower risk and less complex services, they'll require uh, verification assessments only. If you're delivering higher risk services, either um, against the core module only or you need additional modules, you will require a certification assessment. Uh, at the moment, we're looking at what's required. Oh, we're, we were looking at verification assessment. There's a number of, the majority of um, registration groups fit within the low risk and less complex service Shall groups. We, However, we go back to that, slide we can go so back to that can... one. Yeah. No, that's no this right. one, yeah, the this certification one, yeah. of the, yeah, this one. Um, so probably the one that applies um, in this scenario is therapeutic supports. If you've got that, you will only need a verification assessment. A verification assessment occurs once in three years. It's not against the practice standards that Cherie was showing you before. There's a specific set of standards that are relevant to a verification assessment. Uh, can I just ask mm. one thing? And if that, if that provider is delivering also a high risk, then more complex, and a um, lower risk, less complex support, they will be doing a certification? High, exactly. So the higher, the higher the risk, um, the more rigorous the assessment. So they basically. could be doing one from a verification and yes. one from certification, but they will be doing a, a certification. Exactly. Yep. And we would apply the certification standard to them in that case. Yep. Yeah. So, um, good question. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> I'm asking the questions now. <laughs> so, so, this webinar today is really all about the uh, certification assessment. So, I just wanted to touch on verification. Um, so, for certification, we will, we have those registration groups that have the higher risk and complexity and they require uh, assessment against the core module as well as against the specific uh, indicators that relate to their registration groups. When we are doing the assessment, we're actually assessing against not just the outcome, not just the module, but each quality indicator. So Cherie was talking earlier about the quality indicators in relation to information management, for instance. We need to evidence uh, that each of those quality indicators are met in relation to the verification assessment, in the certification assessment. Um, one of the other things about the certification assessment, so it's actually a two-step process. So you have what's called a stage one assessment, which is in essence a document review. So it's off-site. We will review the information that you have uploaded to the Commission's portal, and that will be policies and procedures. If you haven't been able to upload all of your documents to the Commission's portal, uh, you can provide them to us and we will verify them. You are provided with a report at the end of that assessment, and that report will uh, let you know if you're ready to proceed to the next stage or if there's work that you need to do to pr proceed to the next stage. So while we can't say categor categorically by looking at your policies and procedures at that point that you're eligible for registration, we have an indication by reviewing your policies and procedures how you're going. The next phase is the stage two assessment and that's conducted on site. Uh, you will receive a lot of information to help you prepare for that going forward. Uh, 
Um, so your stage two assessment, as I said, is on site. While your documentation at this point is important, what's more important is that we assess how your quality management system is applied across all of your services. So that involves interviews and interviews form the main part of um, our assessment methodology. So we will talk to your governing body, your board directors for instance, we'll talk to your workers, we'll talk to your participants as well. We will also review files as part of this process. So we really are looking at gathering evidence from a wide range of areas so that we can ensure the Commission that you're eligible for registration and make a recommendation in relation to that. At, if you operate across a number of sites, uh, we'll agree with you prior to the audit how, which sites we will be visiting, but again, we need to talk to participants and workers at each site. At the conclusion of the on-site audit, we present the findings to your organisation's management and any other interested parties who want to be involved in the audit process. So um, that could be participants, that could be workers. A couple of other things to remember in relation to certification assessments are that you will have a mid-cycle assessment that will be on site and the date for that mid-cycle assessment is actually aligned to your registration renewal date, not your certificate expiry. So in the past, in other standards, uh, everything, your dealings were with the certification body or in this case the approved quality auditor. Under the NDIS practice standards assessments, everything is linked back to the Commission and the registration expiry date. So that's important to remember. Some of the things that we're looking at as we're on site and reviewing your operations. So for instance, in relation to governance and operational management, if we were looking at the outcome of uh, participant support is overseen by robust governance and operational management systems relevant or proportionate to the size scale of the provider and the so scope and complexity of supports delivered. Um, we look at the outcome indicator uh, of opportunities provided by the governing body. Kinds of documentation that we would be looking at, and these are examples only, they're not prescriptive. Again, it's to it's dependent on the size and scale of the organisation. So we may want to look at a policy specifying that board membership should include certain number of people with lived experience. We may want to look, well, we will want to look at your strategic plan. Um, if we look at uh, the outcome indicator defined structure implemented by the governing body to meet our governing bodies financial, legislative, leg regulatory and contractual responsibilities. Um, it would be good to have a matrix of your organisational policies and procedures that's mapped to the practice standards, NSMHS uh, and any other relevant regulations. We may want to, we will generally look for meeting minutes uh, about working groups uh, and, and so on and so forth. If we wanted to test the outcome indicator of the skills and knowledge required for the governing body, um, role descriptions or position descriptions specifying the roles for which lived experience is either required or desired are a really good starting point for that. One thing to remember when you're preparing all of your documentation is uh, a number of artefacts that you have will actually meet a number of different indicators. So it will map back to a number of different indicators. So it's not um, multiple documents for one indicator. Look at um, your overall management system and your operations and how you work and look at the uh, outcome indicators that are relevant to your scope and work out what it is that you've got for each layer. 
One of the key features of the NDIS practice standards is the scheme actually enrols all participants automatically into the audit process. That means that if a participant does not want to be sampled, does not want to talk to an auditor, they must opt out. This is quite a departure from what um, a lot of providers have been familiar with in the past. And what that means is when you're preparing for your audit, you must have a system or a method of providing your participants with the opportunity to opt out. Part of the preparation for the on-site assessment is your audit body will ask you for a list of all of your participants. That's de-identified. We don't want to see any participant personal information. Uh, so from that de-identified list, the auditors will select a random number of or random participants to conduct file reviews on and to actually interview. The interviews can be conducted in a range of different ways. It can be face-to-face, -face, it can be over the phone. Uh, in some circumstances, we can do focus groups. We prefer we get better outcomes um, by talking to people as individuals or with their support workers with them. Um, but this is a key difference under this scheme. So you need to be prepared to advise your participants, invite them to the opening meeting, invite them to the closing meeting uh, and engage them in the audit process because, as I've said, one of the key features of this scheme is that it's, it's all about achieving better services and better outcomes for participants and we don't know that if we don't talk to people. So. That's why we're doing it. It's almost common sense, isn't it? Oh, it is. Mm. It is. Yeah. It mm. is. Yes. Yes. Um, if, yeah, it, and again, if you have a participant who actually doesn't want to participate in the audit process, that's okay. That's, that's their, their right. That's mm -hmm. their, their choice. Mm -hmm. um, but as a provider, you need to make sure that it's been documented and will be available for the auditor to, to review. Mm. And, and again, this is another test of how your um, quality management system or your documents um, are working for you. Yeah. Yeah. It's one of those things where if you zoom out far enough and you think about the broader goal, of course you want to involve the participants. Yeah. But like when you're just in the middle of preparing for the audit and getting things ready, like it's, it's so easy to miss, even though when you think about it in hindsight. Mm. Yeah. Sense. Yeah. yeah. Participants are core cool, um, and, they're, and they're core cool to this. Or to audit. Yeah. Mm. That's the message I'm getting from both mm. of you today. Keeping yeah. them safe. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Um yeah, okay, so I guess pitfalls. Um yeah, make sure that participants are aware that they're automatically included in sampling unless they've opted out. Uh, and that they have enough notice and opportunity to opt out. So if participants have agreed to be in, in, engaged in the audit process, uh, let them know in advance what the requirements are, find out what supports they need. Um, and also, it's a good idea to talk to your audit body and the auditors in advance as to how they can actually engage with participants in the best possible way to get the best outcome. Pitfalls. Mm. Yeah, gotta watch out for these, don't we? Mm. Again, <coughs> um, if, is that the last slide that you had? Yeah. Yes, yes okay. Yeah. Well, we've actually had a, a, like a ton of questions come through. Okay, great. Uh, I'm just going to work out <laughs> what order we should do for these. And, and again, you probably don't need a reminder because you have been submitting so many questions, but it's the purple icon to get involved with the chat. It's at the top of your screen. We've got a whole lot of questions. So I'll, I'll try and save time by not reading out names, but, but one question we've got is why do I need to go through this with professional registration as well as the National Mental Health Standards? I don't need anything else. Um, look, our, your APRA registration is fine. That's one of the the things that the auditors check as part of their process. Uh, NSMHS is also a great standard, but the two of those combined 
don't necessarily meet all of the requirements of the NDIS practice standards, uh, which has been designed uh, to be a higher standard overall. Yep. So and, and also designed around the participant and their choice and control. Um, that and mm. Yes, okay, I see, thank you. Um, another question that's come through is, we've talked a bit about what the term risk means in relation to this part of the practice standards. Is there anything you would add or emphasise about this? Um, so the whole concept of risk within these practice standards, as we've said, is around the risks to participants so and, and their well-being, uh, the quality of the services that they receive. So um, I, I think from my perspective it, it's quite clear. Like, one of the things that we look at as when we do certification assessments is uh, that you have a risk management plan in place and a risk strategy. So we would want to know what you've identified as the key risks within your service and what uh, mitigations you're putting in place to actually resolve those risks. So risk is at a couple of levels. It, it's in the risk of the registration groups, the risks to participants, but it's also within your business and how you're managing it. Yeah, I'd, and I'd just like to continue on from that. And that your risk management system includes um, incident management, so it links to yeah. it. So, yeah. so when you're identifying um, your risk, you're doing it right through risk management, incident management, complaint management, Work, uh, work health mm. and safety, human resource management, financial management, information management, we've just talked mm. about, and governance. So it all links together in the risk, overriding risk. Um, so when you're identifying it and um, you're documenting it, you document it right across all those other systems as well. Yeah, it's the and big picture view, isn't it? Yes, yes. Yeah. it is. Yes. And, you know, backtrack to what I was saying before, this is about not just... So participants are at the core of it, but it will also support you to run a better business if you're following these guidelines. Yep. Okay, cool. Thank you very much. Another question, and they're coming through thick and fast. <laughs> uh, why is the audit process important? And there's a lot of preparation. So what can a psychosocial provider expect from the process? And can you share any examples of how a provider can demonstrate compliance? Yeah, so again, um, the audit process is important to ensure that you're meeting the registration requirements of the NDIS Commission. Um, you can demonstrate compliance by having your quality management systems in place. Make sure that you look at uh, the NDIS practice standards. What are the outcomes that you're looking to achieve? What are the quality indicators that you need to be assessed against? And then look at what policies, procedures and documents you have. The next step in addition to that is to make sure that your workers are educated about how to apply, what your policies and procedures are and how to apply them. And then the next phase in that is to ensure that your participants or your service users actually understand what their um, entitlements or rights are in relation to the service that you're providing. Thank you. Another question we've got coming through is, do auditors interview participants or service users? Does an auditor have the capacity to engage with consumers and carers in a way that makes them feel safe and respected? Uh, yes, look, absolutely interviewing participants, service users is part of the audit process. Our auditors uh, have a lot of experience in interviewing people with um, issues, disabilities. Uh, recently, one of our auditors conducted an interview uh, on a beach as, okay. a, as the participant was fishing because he didn't feel safe being inside a building. Yeah, okay. uh, so the support worker was there as well. She put her iPad away because that would make him feel uncomfortable and conducted the interview uh, as he was fishing, and that went really well. There's another um, example of interviewing a participant under a boab tree. So it's it's about the conversation to make sure that um, p 
participants feel safe and can actually share their experience. It's not um, interrogate. We're not interrogating people. We want to understand what they have actually experienced. That's a fantastic example, uh, Fiona. I, I love that. Yeah, that's yeah. great. How but, would you? Yeah, yeah, definitely. Yeah. Oh no, maybe not today in the rain. <laughs> no, but, um, no. Oh, I'm, I'm going to share that when I get back to the commission. I think that's, that's a win-win for everybody mm. because as yeah, as as an auditor, you would get more accurate information mm. to work with. Yeah, it's, it's good. And it gives, so it, it gives you confidence in the quality of the service that people are experiencing, which is what we do it for, really. It's good to know people have their smarts about them. I mean, the word audit in itself can be scary. And like you use the word interrogation. <laughs> well, that's what people, and, yeah. yeah, that's what people see it as, you know. It can be scary. We don't want it to be scary. We want it to result in better service. Because that's the real aim. It's to help everybody. Mm. Mm. Uh, we've got heaps of other questions coming through. I've got a very simple one here. Uh, oh, where did it go? Oh, keep moving. <laughs> they keep moving. Will the auditors want to interview the same sample of participants as the file audit selections? Generally, yes. Yeah. Yeah, we prefer to. Cool. Uh, do organisations need to pay for an audit? And how often do they need to take place? Uh, yes, providers do need to pay for an audit. So you have a stage one and a stage two audit for your initial registration. Uh, depending on how your state of readiness, it can be between six weeks and two months between the stage one and stage two in your first year. 18 months following the confirmation of your registration, that you then have a mid-cycle assessment and then 18 months following that, you go through a recertification assessment. Great, thank you. Another question is, does the training provided to auditors specifically deal with psychosocial disability? It depends on, yes, the um, NDIS training does deal with that. Yeah. Um, and yeah. So um, just to elaborate on that, there is a half-day um, disability awareness training, um, which includes um, mental health. Oh, yes. Okay. Cool. Thank you. Um, i got to work out where we got up to. They're just coming through. So are you able to provide an example of what is best practice in terms of the way participant information is stored by it? Um, we, we've done that one. We've done that one. I was going to yeah. say, that sounds familiar. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> oh, gee. I wish I had a way to sort of mark these as they came through. Um, I might, we might take, uh, where did the other ones go? You know what, I, I actually had a few questions myself while I'd like to get my screen in order. Um, you know how we were talking about um, examples of how we can demonstrate compliance? I was thinking um, if we could maybe uh, highlight the benefit it has to both the provider and also to the participants. Um, of having improve or oh, having a continuous quality improvement mindset yeah it, it almost sounds like a trite thing to say but i think in the hustle and bustle of getting documentation ready making sure the right people are interviewed at the right times maybe thinking about locations outside of the office or the, or the buildings you, people might lose sight of why we're doing this why we're doing this so mm. maybe if we could if both of you could contribute what your thoughts might be on the benefits to everybody involved yeah well you know um if you haven't been exposed to uh, quality standards in the past, they really help you to look at how you're working and to review, could you be doing something better? So one of the questions that you're asking yourself is, what can we do differently? How can we provide better services? We know that if we're meeting customer needs or service user needs uh, and, and they speak highly of a service, we're going to grow our business. But it's really about developing a gradual and ongoing incremental improvement process and that's really at the heart of quality improvement. Mm -hmm. um, I just want to continue on from there that um, if, you know, as you said, you get, you do, you get really worked up and, and really involved in, in getting, going through this audit process, but at the end of the day, what you're getting out of that or what is, is what the participants are getting out of that. They're getting a, a safe and, and quality service and a service um, that throughout the practice standards, we keep coming back down to, that it's, that it's participant focused. Um, and if you pass your audit, you are a participant focused organisation that has choice and control and really importantly is safe. Yeah, well, thank you very much. I think 
I think everybody involved in the whole space understands the importance of ongoing audits and, mm. and continuous improvement. Mm. Um, would you say, would you be of the opinion that like, uh, having seen a couple of industries in recent years go under things like royal commissions and there's a greater scrutiny on things like governance, regardless of the industry you're in, would you say there's a bigger focus now on audits and getting these done properly than there were? It's, it's, yes, there is. Uh, it's been incremental over time. I think what we've got in the disability sector at the moment is, is right for where we're at now. It's helping organisations who haven't been exposed to quality in the past to actually develop an understanding of how it can provide better outcomes for their service users. And as I said, it helps them run their business better. It, it's not just about a big stick. It really is about helping organisations to do things better. Through that, it, it's an independent third party who you can trust coming in to tell you what you're doing well. It's not all about looking for mistakes. Waste it's, of failure. it's not. Yeah. It's no. not. It's about looking at what you're doing well, celebrating that and looking at how you can improve. Yes, that's really good. Great really response. good. I mean, I, yeah. I, I suppose that's the whole reason we've got this new legislation that's coming in the first mm. place, isn't it? Mm. That's right. Yeah. Yeah. Good. Thank you. Uh, I've got some of my question cues in order now. We've got <laughs> a question here. What other resources does the Commission have that can help me with my registration? Excellent, yes. Uh, so, as I said before, go to the website um, and there's, under, um, I know I'm trying to visualise visualize the website to, to assist you, but go to the website, so NDIS Commission, and you will find um, there's a tab that says service providers. Uh, click on that tab and that tab then drills down into certain areas. So, we've got, if you're a new provider, there'll be a new registration. Um, if you're renewing your provider, there's a new, new renewing registration tab. And within in there, there are a number of documents. So as I said, um, my key document is the NDIS practice standards, but there's also there's also a, docu a number of documents in there which actually map out all the steps in, in registration from um, applying through the application form and what, what's expected of a provider um, right through um, to pressing the button to submitting your application. Um, so check out the website and as I said, um, if through the application process um, and when you're applying or once you have applied, um, just just give us a call and we might, be, we might, sorry, we will, <laughs> that didn't come out right, we'll be able to help you through that process. Um, when you're looking for an auditor, the website has um, the approved quality or NDIS approved quality auditors. Uh, currently there are 15 approved quality auditing auditing bodies. Yes, um, AQAs. Uh, a, yep, Fiona's uh, one of them. And then there's, uh, so the, the contact numbers are there to, to ring them. But there is a step-by-step -step process that says, now it's time to ring the auditor. And it also says what you need to be able to give to an auditor um, so that they can then um, work out what type of audit they're going to do. Yes. Yes. I was also going to think um, on top of those resources, on this particular webinar, there's a resources tab that people can click yes, on. Yes, fantastic. Um, yes, specifically there's some documents and links for governance and operation management uh, that give some more examples of evidence that you might already have in place. Mm -hmm. So make sure you click the light blue button there. Another question here is, are you able to provide any information about how a participant can prepare for the audit process? Sounds like a roughly similar kind of question. Mm. Yeah, but how a participant can prepare for an audit process. Um, yes, look, it's really understand what the service is that you're providing and be prepared to talk to the auditor about it. Let, understand that uh, the auditor is going to want to review your file and may actually ask you questions about what they've seen in your file to find out what your experience has been. But it's, um, it shouldn't be an invasive process. It should be quite comfortable. Yeah, sure. Uh, a follow-up question from something we were talking about earlier. Fiona has mentioned that participants should be invited to the opening and closing meetings of yes. the audit. Does this mean all participants or only the ones involved in the audit process? Uh, it's, it's a good idea to let your participants know that you are going through an audit. Remember that they're um, automatically included in the audit process. So um, if they are interested, 
they're eligible to attend. They don't have to attend. It's not just the participants who have been selected to be sampled. It's all participants. Yep. Okay, yes. These are some really good questions that are coming through. Um, do auditors need an understanding or experience in psychosocial disability to effectively audit psychosocial providers? Uh, not an in-depth. It depends on the registration groups that we're assessing. We may need somebody with uh, technical expertise in a couple of registration groups. However, in general, we're not actually assessing the provider's competence. We're assessing, um, actually, we're not assessing the provider's professional competence uh, in the area that they're registered with ARPRA in. We're actually assessing how they deliver services and whether they're delivering services in relation to the practice standards requirements. I think, um, thank you. Uh, there's a, I'm trying to balance the amount of minutes that we have left. Yes. We need to slowly start wrapping up. <laughs> um, I'm starting to think with the other questions that we haven't addressed yet, we might get back to you offline. That's probably the best way to deal with it at this stage. Before we close up the webinar, we're going to do a couple of things. First of all, remember how we put up a poll at the start of the webinar? Mm. Uh, we will put up an, a secondary follow-up poll here, and it is how would you rate your knowledge of the NDIS practice standards and registration requirements having heard this webinar now? And while we wait for those results to come in, I'll, I'll let you know what the results were at the start of the webinar. Um, we had nobody hit five for expert. Mm. This was um, at, the, at the start of the webinar. 24% mm -hmm. were low. 36% were building, 28% were sound, and 12% were advanced. So I'd be really keen to see how they... I feel like I'm under pressure now. <laughs> <laughs> we're being audited. Oh, no, we've been audited. <laughs> no, it's a test. It's not an audit. Yeah, again, the, the, the focus should be on the participants of the webinar. Yes, and, exactly. And their learning. Yes, that's right. And, and the improvement they're in. So we'll wait for some of the, um, the responses to come through. And as I can see already, like it's... It's updating in real time, so I won't give you the final thing until it's all. Mm -hmm. But it's looking like nobody has hit the low one. So all the people who Thank had hit you. low, <laughs> they've moved themselves on that's to a two good. or a three or a four. That's and good I'll, to hear. I'll give you the stats a bit later on. But that's continuous improvement. Continuous mm. improvement. That's what we're all about. That's what we want to yes. feedback so we can improve. <laughs> I was going to say, would you like to conclude with one last uh, closing remark each? I would say use the audit as an opportunity to help your business improve so that you can deliver better services to your service users. Mm -hmm. um, I'd just like to say that we're looking forward to receiving your registration and your final, final audit report um, so that we can have you as registered providers. Um, my only advice is to um, digest the NDIS practice standards when you're developing your quality management system um, any, and any feedback. The Commission's always looking for feedback. So if there's something you can't find on the website, uh, please feedback to us uh, because it might be there or it might help us with our continuous improvement. Excellent. Cherie okay. Avalos and Fiona McLaughlin. Sorry, not McLaughlin. Fiona, Fiona Lachlan. Lachlan. I'm sorry. <laughs> Just it's all good. Making up surnames today. <laughs> Thank you very much for being on the webinar today. Thank really you. enjoyed getting the insights from you. Thank, Thank you, you very much. And as I'm sure uh, everybody has felt the same way, we've got uh, right now the current total stands at 30% at building, 55% uh, at sound, 15 at advanced, and that's an improvement on every single count, and nobody at low. Wonderful. So well, thank audit, you very much. The audit results mm. are in. That's from us. Our audit results. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. And if you want to better understand the NDIS access or planning or support coordination or plan management or any other matter that would be relevant to people living with a mental health condition who may be eligible for some assistance, go to a link. It's on your screen right now. Uh, actually, it's not on your screen right now, but the link is reimagine.today. Reimagine, one word, dot today. This link is available actually in the resources library, my apologies, along with the new resource updates from this webinar. Keep an eye out for an invitation to the next webinar, which is going to unpack the second part of the, the quality indicators for governance and operational management. There's just so much to go through. We can't do it possibly yes. in one or two webinars. It's taking the whole series of 10. <laughs> and of course, the project manager, uh, Karen Hersey from the MHCC is keen to hear your feedback. She would love to chat with providers of NDI psychosocial services about any of these issues in applying the practice standards or new registration requirements 
preparing for an audit, resources you'd like to see in the library for the next webinar, or other topics you'd like to be covered in future webinars. So don't be afraid, get in touch with us. We'll redirect you to a survey link at the end of this webinar. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you, thank you, Cherie. Thank you, Fiona, one thank more you. time. Yep. And thank you for joining us in the Learning Cafe. And we'll yep. see you next time. Thanks, everyone. Thank you.